Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine, and I'm now going to say, and friends of Baylor College of Medicine, because it turns out there's a lot of people who are watching this who are not necessarily members of the family, but if you watch any of the YouTubes, then you automatically become an honorary Baylor College of Medicine family. Uh, and if uh, for those of you who want, just have questions, feel free to, um, to uh, send them in. Anyway, so it's been a really uh, eventful week uh, for me. As it turns out, uh, September 1st was my 10-year anniversary here. Um, I, I remember when I first got here, one of my favorite faculty members, uh, Danny Jones, who was the chair of ophthalmology at the time, uh, came up to me one day. I'd been there, I'd been here for about a month. I was just getting over the shock of all the things I had to do here. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. And uh, uh, Danny came up to me one day and said, you know, the over under on you is three years. You'll never make it more than three years. And I'm sitting there going, Danny, are you kidding me? I just got here. And uh, yeah, so there was faculty were actually betting I wouldn't make it for three. So when I made it to 10, I was feeling pretty good about myself. And it was very nice, actually, uh, the board of trustees, and I thank David Baldwin for doing this, sent a ni nice note to the faculty to remind them I'd been here for 10 years. And at the time, actually, Harry Reisner was uh, the head of the search committee and a very scary lawyer. And uh, Mark Shapiro was the chairman of the board. And so thanks to everybody for giving me the opportunity to uh, be at such a great institution. Uh, and in the spirit of shout outs, I'd like to do a few shout outs. Uh, again, a pretty eventful week. First of all, uh, Shad Deering was named the Associate Dean uh, at, at uh, Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Shad's a great guy. He was also named this week one of the health heroes of San Antonio. So I was very excited about that for him. And we had a faculty meeting this week that went really great uh, you know, with the faculty in the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Also wanted to do a shout out for Mark Boom and Methodist. Uh, Mark, of course, is a Baylor grad, which is why we take credit for everything he does. But I give uh, Methodist a lot of credit. They've been, they did a, a chronicle wrap. They've been putting advertisements all over the city. They've been advertising in the paper to really public service announcements around Labor Day. Uh, trying to remind people we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We had spikes before in Memorial Day and July 4th and trying to message to the community, remember to stay at home, be thoughtful, be careful, don't go out in big groups big family get-togethers, and I'm reminding you as well, but uh, big shout out to Mark uh, and Methodist for putting the, uh, the funds into, into basically what's public service announcements. Also, a huge shout out to Nancy Marino. I, I dumped the responsibility on her to uh, figure out all the issues related to opening schools, and she's come up with a fantastic primer on how do you open a school from uh, sort of an administrative perspective. That is being made available uh, online, on BioEd online. Anyone can access that. Anyone in the United States that's involved with school or uh, kids' education, K through 12, that's free and available if you want to look at it. She's in the process of completing what the other task I dumped on her, which is to come up with a two-week curriculum that was appropriate age-related uh, for um, uh, public health education in the first couple of weeks of school. So she's busy working on that and hopefully that will be up there too. I wanted to give a giant shout out to Liz Youngblood. In addition to being the president of Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, she's totally responsible for the construction project on the McNair campus. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there's not just one crane, but two cranes. And so we now are at Two Crane School. That's so exciting for us. Uh, the McNair campus development is going on and I I would hope all of you who have a chance to drive by uh, Cambridge and Old Spanish Trail to see the cranes going up, uh, it, it'd be great. And, to, and I also want to acknowledge that uh, the Center for Pursuit gave awards to our own Jim McDevitt, the uh, Senior Vice President for Clinical Affairs, and Peter Hotez, the Dean of the School for Tropical Medicine, for all of their work uh, in providing education to the public around uh, COVID-19 and the global pandemic. So anyway, big shout outs to all you folks who have had such an important role this past week. I'm really proud of everybody uh, who's doing that. Everyone's trying to do their share to try and get through this uh, together. So really interesting studies also came out this week. Uh, two great papers. 
Uh, you'll remember I talked last week about the importance of T cells and educating B cells to create antibodies and that paper that showed even if antibodies wane, there's some T cell memory. Well, two different groups looked at something really interesting, which is just to take people who had never been exposed to COVID uh, at all, to SARS-CoV-2, and look if they had any uh, T cell reaction to any parts of the virus, whether it's the spike protein or other proteins. And both of these groups found that T cells uh, did respond, even from naive people, people who had never been infected by SARS-CoV-2, had a slight immune response to various uh, domains of the virus. That is huge, because that, what that suggests is that many of these other coronaviruses, common colds that people get, uh, particularly younger people get, may be inducing some cross-reactive T cell immunity that is able to recognize uh, SARS-CoV-2, which would imply that when they're infected, they might get a more rapid or more, more robust immune response, a little bit like a booster. That could explain why uh, there, the, the people who, there are some people who get very sick and some people who don't. That could be a big part of it. If you have some baseline immune response left over from other viruses, uh, that might mitigate some of the disease uh, process when you get infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Now, th that is not unprecedented. If you go back again, you know, the Spanish flu uh, in 1917, 18, and 19, um, you, you recall we talked about this a few uh, weeks back, but the fact was that the people who got sickest were young folks. And there was a reason for that, potentially, in that about 40 years before, in the late 1800s, a group of flu viruses had been present and probably infected people who were 40 or more, 40 or older at that time. And, and so they probably had some innate immunity that might have helped mitigate the response to that particular Spanish flu strain. It's very similar. It might be why young people today are not as uh, being as infected or as affected by the disease as older people. We know there's a lot of genetic reasons. This doesn't explain everything. There are families who have had uh, SARS-CoV-2 and all have died. That's a genetic problem. We know there are, there are pathways in the ACE2 receptor that probably also that also probably mediate some of the severity of the disease. The profound over response that you have, some people have with the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 that gives them a, a, an acute respiratory syndrome-like uh, illness also plays a role, but it's really interesting to think that one of the reasons younger people are handling it better is they have uh, more of a T cell uh, immune response from all the coronaviruses they might have been exposed to in the recent you know, 10 to 15 years. So anyway, that's very, very uh, interesting um, uh, couple of papers. In addition, another great study did a uh, a meta-analysis of a bunch of papers on dexamethasone, and it's now clear that dexamethasone is the most effective thing in treating uh, severe uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections. So people who are oxygen dependent, this has reduced mortality by 30%. It's a clear uh, signal. Death dexamethasone works and probably is the standard of care now, even better than remdesivir. So that was a big uh, step forward again uh, this week. So lots of good stuff going on. Uh, I wanted to, once again, give you some updates on our own data. Uh, we've had a sort of a mixed week, I'd say. Uh, it, a lot of good news, uh, a lot of good news. Uh, if you look at the percent positivity of our testing, we're down to now about 5.5%. We're not yet to 5%, which is our target, but we're getting there. Our new case load has been running about between 12 and 1,500. We still need to get it down to 200. The only concern is that our... Our effective reproduction rate of the virus has moved above one, and that wasn't good. I think this is still a data problem. Uh, one, of the one of the factors that goes into the calculation of the R number is the number of new cases. And the way we get it by county is we get the data from the state. The state tends to batch their, their results from the 600 different sources of information they get, so it's very hard for them to provide like real-time data. When we just look at the TMC data, which is nine counties, Harris County and surrounding eight, and look at our infection rate, that drops the R number way below one. So 
it looks at least like in our community, in, in, in our surrounding counties, we're doing pretty well. And the, it's really all good news. The only bad news is Labor Day. <laughs> and it seems like every time we have a holiday and people get together, we have a spike. So if somehow we can get through Labor Day without people misbehaving and not following the rules and not wearing masks and getting together on beaches and getting family together, uh, if we can get through that without a big bump, I think we'll actually be in good shape to th even think about potentially opening schools in another month uh, to six weeks. So that's uh, the data from the Texas Medical Center. I will point out the hospitalizations are down, ICU occupancy is down. So all that's good, but you know, remember I told you that's not what we should be following. We really need to be following the community spread because that's going to be deciding when we you know, open schools. And there's no question to me that opening schools will be the most important stimulus to our economy because people can't work if they're at home taking care of their kids. So one of the things I want to do this week is it's never too early to start thinking about what we could have done better. And, you know, we're still having problems, uh, unfortunately. It, I'll just give you two examples. The FDA came out with this, you know, emergency use of plasma, but even though we don't have the data that supports it. So that really makes it hard to do studies. So where we now know dexamethasone works, we still do not have definitive evidence that using convalescent uh, plasma is helpful. And why is that bad? Well, if it's not helpful because there's not enough antibody, then what might be helpful is concentrated antibodies that are currently in randomized trials. But if everyone's using plasmapheresis, it's going to be very difficult to make that distinction. And so the FDA should not have done that, and everybody, all the scientists were complaining about it, but it, I understand the pressure on the FDA, but they shouldn't have done that. And the CDC, uh, there were some issues around uh, getting ready to, you know, have, start giving vaccines. Well, the vaccine trials aren't even done yet. So that was really goofy, but the CDC came out of nowhere, and I was so thrilled about this, decided that you can't throw people out in the streets. So they, they actually pushed uh, the legislation that you, or the directive that you can't evict people, which thank God they did that because we'd have 30 million people in group homes spreading virus around. It, it just, it was the right thing to do and they should have done that. So I started thinking about it. Well, what should we be doing? What's, what's wrong with the way we've handled this? Every single night you'll hear on every single news station why we're not being as good as another country or what we've done wrong. So what, what should we have done? Well, I think that first and foremost, what this pandemic has shown us is that we have a problem with our public health infrastructure. And the single biggest problem to me is that we haven't been able to collect accurate real-time data. So the reason TMC has been so effective in sort of guiding principles and policies in our community is because we're sharing real-time data. But it's no other way to get that. And the way our fragmented public health system works, uh, it's almost impossible to think it could ever work. So we need to change that. So right now you have state public health, county public health, city public health, people worry about who's responsible for what. There is no governance around sharing data. There's no scrubbing of data. There has to be a single source of data managed by the CD, uh, managed through our public health department. And to me, that has got to be the number one thing we begin to fix. Uh, we can start now, but certainly are going to have to fix in the future. The second major thing is the CDC. Uh, the CDC needs a major reinvestment. Who should be leading uh, the policies in a global pandemic? It ought to be the Center for Disease Control. <laughs> That's their job. That's what they should be doing. They should be doing all the policy things around uh, mask wearing, you know, social distancing, opening of businesses, opening of schools. The CDC should be leading that. And that hasn't happened. And I, I have no idea exactly why it hasn't happened. I was thrilled that the CDC stepped up around this issue of uh, people being evicted, but they should be doing all this. And so the next, next pandemic, we should be having nightly uh, debriefings on all the news channels by the Center for Disease Control. And frankly, in the future, we ought to be getting updates on a regular basis about all the emerging infectious diseases that are out there. 
that are representing that represent you know risk to the population. So that's the second thing. The CDC really needs uh, to be in control. The NIH should be telling us about studies going on. The CDC should be telling us about public health. The NIH ought to be dictating what studies are being done. Uh, so wouldn't it be great if every night you had a debriefing from the Center for Disease Control and then the NIH? And every day we'd hear all the stuff that's going on about managing the epidemic and what we need to do around policy, and at the same time all the new studies going on and all the information. That should be how we're leading through a global pandemic until we start electing officials that are scientists and doctors and infectious disease exper experts, it's hard to understand why you would put a group of people in charge of running something that isn't the people who have expertise. So the CDC and the NIH just need to really step up uh, in the, in the uh, future. The third thing is we're all talking about, you know, it, our decaying infrastructure and investing in roads and bridges. Well, I got an idea. Let's invest in schools. You know, I'm not sure why we decided that schools should be a petri dish for all infectious diseases. You don't, you know, you, you go to a hospital or clinic, you don't, people are careful, but our schools, we just throw kids in and they breed all these infectious diseases, whether it's flu or coronaviruses. We haven't really looked at how would we provide safety in schools. And it, we don't want to keep them in a sterile environment. But how about ventilation and HEPA filtration and, and UVC and thinking about ventilation in windows and, and smaller groups and, and, and trying to think about how you would want to make a safe environment for our schools. We could invest a lot of money, create a lot of, jar, uh, a lot of jobs, uh, a lot of biotech industry advancement if we really invested in safe schools. And I just don't understand why we do that, why we're so careful about everything else and then we just throw our kids into some giant uh, petri dish to see if, what they can grow. So that's the third thing I would do. And the fourth thing, <clears throat> it's real clear we need more than episodic vaccine structures here. I mean, right now, if something happens, we all focus on a vaccine. We need to have vaccines constantly being produced, whether, whether it's you know, Ebola or respiratory syncytial virus <laughs> or serious bacterial infections. There's a lot of infectious diseases happening all around us, and we need constant focus on that. We did pretty well on flu. We've had a good structure for managing flu. We have a whole vaccine strategy, vaccine treatment units all over the country. We have, we have scientists that think about it. We did that for HIV. We really need to do that for a whole host of other uh, vaccines, you know, that, that it's just really important that that be a high priority and that industry is constantly going for all kinds of different infectious diseases, uh, not just this per, per, uh, current coronavirus uh, pandemic. And the last thing, uh, just to be a little bit out there, we have to rejoin the World Health Organization. We can't take our ball and go home from the, D, the WHO. The infectious diseases start everywhere in the world there has to be a, a mechanism for global surveillance. You know, we may not like what's going on, but we've got to participate. You know, whether it's HIV or Ebola in Africa or coronaviruses and flu in Asia, uh, mad cow disease in Europe, dengue fever in South America and Brazil, all these things require an infrastructure for world health surveillance. We have to be a participant of it. I think if we don't like what's going on, we should put more money into the WHO. We should be a, the biggest participant and make sure the WHO is serving the needs of our country to keep us all safe. Because most of these infectious diseases are emerging in other parts of the world in order for us to be safe. We need a structure that, uh, that really works uh, to the benefit of all. Frankly, I'd be investing in, the, in, in supporting the Wuhan Institute for Coronaviruses. They're the world's authority. I mean, these are the kinds of things, we need those kinds of partnerships. Anyway, so that's my five-part plan for fixing all things around global pandemics um, in the country. You know, not that I, it's not going to my head. I got the five-point plan for going back to school. <laughs> I got the five-point plan for solving all healthcare crises in the United States. I know it's a little silly, but Anyway, the, the real purpose is just to have people think about 
of these issues independent of the politics. I'm just thinking about what should we be doing that makes sense. Uh, anyway, so it's been a, a really great week, a lot of great science going on. We're learning a lot more about the virus. Uh, a little bit of a teaser, I can't wait. Next week we're going to talk about wastewater, waste management, the microbiome. Lots of great stuff going on there. Uh, there's some new developments uh, around antigen capture tests. So lots of, lots of really great science going on. Uh, and of course, as always, Baylor College of Medicine is in the middle of all of this. Uh, so proud of the people working here. Uh, I mentioned uh, Jim and Peter. I'm, a lot of thought leaders, a great science going on in the microbiome field, our vaccine group, uh, all of our learners, our teachers, everything's going uh, incredibly well here. Uh, so I, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be here for 10 years. It's been a wonderful experience. It's, uh, it's been great. I look forward to seeing all of you. Thank you for the comments. Could keep them coming. Uh, and for those of you who are not immediate employees or members of the community, feel free to also write in uh, for any questions that you have. So have a great weekend. Uh, I'm planning to also have a great weekend. Uh, I'm going to take it easy this Labor Day, but I'm not going to do anything that's uh, risky business. So have a great weekend and I will see you all next week. Bye bye. Anyway, it's great to be here, uh, and I'm really looking forward to working with all of you. So thank you very much.